is also the master of improvisation. Yes. That's quite hard to say, actually, for me. Because I always get my words completely wrong during this opening. But it no, is, of course, John Sessions. Hey, hey. When did you first realise that you were so good at mimicking? Um, when I was ten, I was at school, and uh, with this amazing religious knowledge teacher called Dan Dickey. And, um, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, he got me and this other kid called Tony Barley, Tony, if you're watching, hello, to stand up and improvise the Ten Plagues of Egypt, which I did, and all the kids started to laugh. Um, and it was the first time I'd ever done that. And then by the time I went to the next school, I was doing it all the time. If I saw someone the other day, uh, I, the sixth form used to drag me off to this room and get me to perform for them for a, throughout the lunch time. So I did a sort of workers' playtime. So you can imagine how disgusting I was. So were you Mr. Popular? Um, yeah, I was like a sort of a freak. You know, I was this, <laughs> I was this sort of turn. They would sort of take me off and say, do this teacher, do that teacher, do Patrick Moore, you know. Do Patrick Moore? Mm. Was that one of your specialities? Well, everyone did Patrick Moore, basically. Oh, right. Now, no, yeah. when you're doing Spitting Image, because yeah. you do the voices, don't you? I used you? to. Haven't done it for a long time. Didn't when you were doing that, though, mm. who were the hardest people to do? All, well, most of the cabinet, you know, being sort of faceless, ghastly people that they are, you know, um, very difficult to distinguish. You know, the only really unifying factor was that they all lied, of course, you know, but it didn't get that quality across in the voice. But, um, yeah, I mean, the best way to do it was what Harry Enfield used to do, which was to sort of recreate the character, like he recreated David Steele. But he started off doing a proper David Steele. And then one day, the puppet just went onto David Owen's sort of chest. And suddenly, it all became very homoerotic. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, within a few weeks, you know, David Steele was this sort of emotionally arrested five-year-old. You know, <laughs> you know, oh, David, protect me! <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Which uh, was very funny, you know. So the best, and to reinvent Norman Tebbit as a skinhead and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you also do voiceovers for ads and things. Do you have to be the voice of a salami and stuff like that? I mean, is that hard I to think? I am a salami. <laughs> no. I suspect it. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I tend to do those sort of smart-ass voices, you know, the sort of, uh, so why don't you get one? One of those is that, who, is that the one? I always wondered yeah. who on earth did those Well, there's voices. lots of people do those. Do you never hear a man actually talking No. Like... So maybe you can be a clever bastard like me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, you were, you were quite old. I was going to say, you were quite big when you went to Roddy. You were quite yes. old when you went to... I was very old. I was yes. 300 years old. No, I was 26 when I went to Roddy. Why, what did you do in the gap? I, um... I did ad... Uh, no, I did adverts. No, I didn't do adverts. It's so early in the morning. I did um, a doctorate at a university in Canada, which I didn't complete, but I taught undergraduates. I taught guys about six foot six who couldn't spell their own names, literally. They were doing English literature. And they go, so how come I'm getting a, a D this year and they got a B last year, huh? So what's your problem? You know, they're very big, you know, so you have to tell them because you're illiterate. And what? <laughs> you know, and uh, deal with that, you know. It's kind of difficult. Somebody tell me that you're a big worrier. Really? Yes. What it's do you bad. worry about? Oh, everything. I get up in the morning and I've to kind of remember what I'm worrying about. You know? <laughs> yeah. All that kind of. I worry. I worry permanently. Do you have to keep checking the gas when you've gone to bed? I check the gas. Um, I I go out and I think, did I leave the cooker on? All that kind of stuff. You know. I have a checklist when I go out of things to switch off. Isn't that tragic? You Poor. You don't. No, I do. I have a little clipboard with a list of things on it. Pitiful. I That's true. Now, I felt your tummy just now. Yes. Mm. I, I'm, su I'm surprised you had a tummy at all because of all your working out. Oh. Oh, we didn't, no, oh I haven't got a tummy, have I? Yes. A little weenie one. little weenie one. Um, yes, how well, I didn't... Much, how much exercise do you do? Not a lot. No, I, no when, when I'm doing a sort of big show or something, I, uh, I do lots of exercise. Because um, of the nudity involved. Well, that's it. I did a play a couple of years ago in the West End, and I had to strip off to the waist. And well, this girl went uh, in front row. As soon as I took my shirt off, she went, yeah. But she did it very quietly. It wasn't like to impress oh. her friends. It was a spontaneous, oh, how disgusting. <laughs> so I had to go home and work out for ages. And then I came back with this rippling panther. <laughs> and uh, no, I didn't really. But anyway, but I've been filming the last month, so I eat bacon sandwiches all the mo every morning. That's why I'm, you know. Who have you been working with? Uh, Mr. Coltrane, you may have heard of him. 
So he's a well-known Welsh character actor. <laughs> What's no. he been doing? Robbie's been playing Dr. Johnson, and I've been playing James Boswell in a film written and directed by John Byrne called Tour of the Western Isles, and Ian Dury is in it as a, as a mad magician. Were you, um, were you sort of reformed characters, or were you both um, drinking and carousing? Um, I was doing a lot of whoring, yes. And, uh, yes, but I was. But Boswell was a great horror. Oh. Yes, horror. Mm. Yes. Imagine how Sasha Distel would say that word. Because you know, remember the way he could never say hobbies? He used yeah. to say horribies. <laughs> I know he'd say a horror. 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 Anyway. Are you looking forward to being 40 or is that holding I can't look worries? forward to being 40 because it's already happened. You've already been yeah. 40? I do you hit. feel any inklings of a male menopause? Yes, it's horrible actually. What you really, do you think you, you, hear the, do? you hear the seesaw creak and you see the grim reaper. You really do start thinking about death. I want you to read this booklet, Paula. No, no. It's, um, yeah, it's awful actually. And you think it's going to, because in the 30s, you, even late 30s, you get this illusion that, you know, well, life goes on forever. Then at 40, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's rather serious. Do you think you serious. might buy a red E-type soon? Mm, is that a car? Yes. I, uh, no, that, that, yeah. I think that's what lots of people do, lots of men do when they get to 40. Oh, I don't know. No, I buy one of those cars you have to roll I bought a cardigan. I bought a, car, bought a cardigan. Did you? I thought that was a good thing to do. But quite a lot of young people wear cardigans as well, don't they? But I thought if I wore a cardigan, I could gently, elegantly slip into middle age, you know. I don't want to be a tight-jeaned, trendy in my mid-40s. It's madam. been gorgeous to talk to you. Gorgeous talking to you, Paula. I'm dying to see your film. Right. And now this is, of course, Channel 4, and you're watching The Massive Big Breakfast. And here's Peter Smith with the news.